Um, so there's about 6.6 .6 million Americans currently in the correction system in some way, shape, or form. Uh, that is also the highest per capita incarceration rate of any country ever. So that's, you know, we're talking China, Iran, nation states where you might imagine there might be a higher uh, per capita incarceration rate. That's not true. It's actually the United States is the highest in the world. Um, and what that means is that about 10, over 10,000 uh, formerly incarcerated individuals return home to our communities uh, every week, 10,000 per week in the U.S. Um, I don't remember the exact number in Detroit, but needless to say, it's a very, very high number. Uh, this issue impacts Detroit very uh, directly, and uh, so that's, that's why we're here talking about this today. Uh, these folks are returning as our neighbors, as our family members, as friends. It behooves all of us uh, to ensure that these folks are able to thrive and stay out of uh, stay out of prison and, and not uh, go back to a, a life of crime. Um, so yeah, so some of the topics that we'll be covering are what kind of resources are available, uh, what efforts are, are already underway, um, and how we as, as a community can, can best help. Um, so I want to go ahead and dive right in in the interest of time. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each of you guys. You can come up as I, as I say your name, I suppose. Uh, so first we have Margaret Allen, who is the uh, Detroit Director of CEO, which is the Center for Employment Opportunities. Um, and each of them are going to be giving more context around their work in a moment. So, uh, and then we have Michelle Smart from the founder of a program called Bags to Butterflies. Um, and we have Eric Pitzel, who is a professor at the um, Um, so now I'm going to join you guys on stage so that I'm not awkwardly uh, standing on the side here. Let me switch mics with you. And so, so to, to go ahead and, and dive right in here, I was hoping that each of you could kind of explain um, in a bit more detail uh, who you are, what, uh, what you're working on, and kind of what, what draws you, uh, why, why you're here today. Good evening, I am Margaret Allen, and I'm the Detroit Director for the Center for Employment Opportunities. CEO is a national organization um, that provides employment services to individuals who are returning home from incarceration. We are actually the largest organization in the United States to do that, and we uh, launched an office in Detroit last year, and I was the director to launch that office. Um, our program is a bit unique in that when individuals are released from incarceration, they're referred pretty quickly to us, typically within 30 to 60 days. We believe that there's a pivotal moment where individuals can be more, uh, they're ready to change. And if they're provided support, access, and opportunity in, in that space, then they're more likely to be successful, and that can reduce recidivism. So the work that we do employs individuals every day on work crews, and our participants receive daily pay, daily transportation, daily feedback, and also weekly intense job coaching. Our job coach is right there. Um, and it helps with barrier removal. Individuals come home with a number of different barriers, which we'll talk about more in depth. So um, why do I do this work? So I'm a trainer. Uh, born and raised to remain. Um, I'm the mother of two African American sons, and hopefully, we'll get into um, talking more about how this issue targets my community more. Um, I do this work professionally because it affects me personally. Um, and it doesn't just affect me because I come from a family with individuals who've been incarcerated, but it affects our communities, it destroys families, and um, the work is important for the big picture of the success of Detroit and um, us as a people generally. So. Hello, I am Michelle Smart. I am founder of Bags 2 Butterflies. We are a Detroit-based social enterprise that empowers formerly incarcerated women with transitional employment, with resources, and a wonderful caring network to help the ladies on their journey to success immediately upon their release from incarceration. 
The journey for me started about four years ago when the daughter of my good friend made a split second decision that has changed her life. She is now incarcerated. And we were all quite devastated because she's a beautiful girl and knowing that when she returns home, the opportunities for her will be very limited. Housing, employment, it would be a challenge. So this program helps women as soon as they return to the community, we provide them with the resources and the tools that they need to help them on their journey to success. My name is Aaron Kinzel, I'm a professor of criminology and criminal justice at the University of Michigan Dearborn, and my areas of expertise for teaching and research focus predominantly on corrections and public policy. I've had the um, unique opportunity to visit over 100 correctional facilities in the United States and also over in Europe. Some of these are active correctional facilities, meaning that there are people incarcerated there, but also other ones that I visit are either abandoned or just now um, been transitioned into museums. So I, I really want to uh, understand what carceral spaces do to human beings. And the other piece is um, looking at ways that we can create effective criminal justice policy because um, honestly, if any of you were here right now, I think the assumption is that the system's not probably working the way it should, right? So we need some policy change. So that's the other piece of my life on the side as a consultant. I, um, I've worked with the Department of Justice, I've worked with state agencies, and I really try to find ways that we can look at um, people coming home from prison, but also to improve the conditions of confinement for individuals while they're incarcerated. Access to education, I think, is extremely important. We have a vast majority of people that go into the system that are functionally illiterate or, or don't even have a high school diploma or GED. So us taking the opportunity and the financial means to educate people, particularly post-secondary education, once they get a GED or high school diploma while incarcerated, is only gonna help them transition back home to their communities, and I think that's very important. So why do I do this work? My passion comes from my own experiences in my community as a young man. I was born in Toledo, Ohio. In the inner city, I seen violence, I seen crime, I was experiencing poverty. I never knew my father. Um, as I transitioned out of that area, um, I constantly watched my mother get with men who were actively involved in crime. And eventually I got into the juvenile justice system and then later into the state prison system spending more than half of a 19 year sentence for a violent confrontation with law enforcement. So people can change. And I'm kind of like living experience and proof of that. I almost committed um, you know, an act of violence where someone almost died during a shootout, and here I am now um, changing my life around and helping others in my community. So. So, so again, just continuing to, to paint some context, uh, Reverend Coleman mentioned some of the, the challenges that face uh, folks when they're, when they're coming out of prison. Um, so some of the ones that, that Alan here I mentioned, securing housing, getting an ID, uh, qualifying for public assistance. I think a lot of people don't realize that uh, public assistance, uh, in, in some cases with felonies, uh, becomes unattainable. Um, there's stigma-related challenges. Uh, we mentioned finding a job, um, finding friends, connecting with the community. Um, I was hoping that, that maybe you guys could each share, based on your experience um, in the prison system or working with folks, um, what 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 other types of challenges um, do folks face that we might not be we might not have touched on yet? I think a, a big one from a personal standpoint in my work with hundreds of people that have come home from prison, and this is both men and women, is um, the trauma that they experience in the prison system, which I think is something that we don't necessarily think about. We often think about people in the correctional environments as they cause trauma, which sometimes that's true. They, you know, sometimes people have committed damage to their community or to other individuals, but the, the reality is that being in prison is an extremely traumatic um, lifestyle. And then even before that, many people that go into the prison system were traumatized in their communities, they've experienced violence, they've seen violence, they've been subjected to violence. So very often we have people who are victims, and this is very true to myself, like I was almost murdered as an eight-year-old child by my stepfather who was just a violent psychopath. I used to beat my mother, rape my mother, and I've seen all this as a kid and lots of other things, but like, it doesn't excuse my behavior later on becoming violent, but it explains it to an extent, if that makes sense. So I was kind of groomed, and other people are kind of groomed into it. It's still a choice to an extent, but when you're in a heavily violent environment where you have lack of access to things, so 
I think understanding the trauma that people come home with is, is extremely important. And, the, and like Jacob mentioned, the stigma, the fact that I'm a convicted felon. Like, I, I don't have my doctor degree yet, but I'll have it soon. Um, I'm always going to be a convict before a doctor. That, that stigma is, is forever, it will never go away. Regardless of my accomplishments, I'm always a convicted felon. And, and there's so many people that have the motivation and the ambition, but because of that felony conviction, it, it blocks them out with collateral consequences of conviction, with legal policies, restriction to housing, restriction to college, restriction to uh, just everyday basic needs with maybe Department of Human Services people can't get just because of a stupid label that they been afforded when they were a citizen. I think some of the, uh, the challenges that the women have shared with me for my program is being reunited with their families while incarcerated. They have this idea of being embraced and loved and cared for by their loved ones, and then a lot of times it's totally not the case. Um, the ladies are finding that they're being rejected, um, trying to fit into an environment that they have not been a part of for so many years is quite a challenge. To piggyback off of what um, Aaron mentioned is the trauma. Um, typically, trauma led you to what you got in prison. And then you're further traumatized while you're in prison. And then when you're released, there's a lack of mental health services to support your reentry. And then you're expected to get a job. You're expected to deal with the rejection of not being able to get a job, the rejection of not being able to secure housing. Um, so that's the biggest piece of it. At CEO, our, our goal is to get folks employed, but we understand there, there's a lot that comes before the point that someone's ready to begin work, which is why we provide a transitional work experience where we can work those things out and connect them to supports. But the trauma really is, is the largest piece. But there are also things to face against getting an ID, as Jacob mentioned. Um, we've had individuals come out who never knew their social security number, or they've got seven aliases, and the system isn't sure who they are. Um, those are things that we've got to navigate before we can even get them to work. So um, that's you know, what I wanted to say. We will actually be sharing the program coming out uh, related to issuing IDs um, that we mentioned in a little while here. But uh, what I'd like to do is, is, is next ask about resources that are available. So you just touched on a little bit. So obviously, there's some transitional employment programs available, um, as well as um, certain other resources. I'd love if, if uh, anyone could speak on uh, are, are there resources available for folks that are experienced, have experienced trauma, um, mental health services, or otherwise, uh, to help them deal with that outside of uh, this? Uh, honestly, to my best of my honor, the, the mental health resource is extremely limited, like you mentioned. That. So that's the biggest problem. That's a barrier where um, a lot of people may not even have medical coverage coming out of the system. So like, their access to mental health services are, are, are often, you know, it's a very bumpy ride to try to find that. And honestly, and I don't, I can't speak to the experience of women, but I know for men, we very often come out of the prison system with this hyper masculine, aggressive stance to where we're not going to like talk about you know i have emotional needs or that i was traumatized because that's a symbol of weakness and in a prison environment that's not something that you talk about so to be able to slow down that hyper masculinity and be able to like very um, calmly like ask another man for help or explain to another man and say look you know i've experienced violence or i've seen violence or i've committed violence it's really hard for us to do and I don't think that, you know, we create a societal expectation to where men are supposed to be tough guys and we can't cry and, and all this other BS stuff. That, you know, it's a societal thing and men with prisoners just on this other whole level. Um, other resources that I think that are available, but they're limited, is, is access to post-secondary education. That's something I'm doing at the University of Michigan Dearborn. We're currently a part, um, we're applying to this U.S. Department of Education Pell Grant pilot, so we're hopefully, um, within the next few months, going to go back into the prison systems and give people a college education while they're incarcerated, which I think is extremely important under this Pell Grant pilot. So if any of you hear about that, just tell your congressional members to please support that or repeal the Pell Grant ban that is currently um, not allowing prisoners to have access to this, but there's a pilot program that's going on now. There are currently three. Um, universities that are going into Jackson, um, I think Ionia, and another one I can't recall, but we're hoping to expand that more. And then certainly create a pipeline for people if they get college inside, how can we train them? And it feels that they're actually able to get jobs, because again, that stigma is always going to follow them. Like I, it took me six years to find employment, 
post release while I was uh, on parole. So even with a, uh, an advanced graduate, it was very difficult. So, uh, I guess I asked that question a slightly different way. Um, so starting with Aaron, what what I, what do you wish that someone would have told you when you were first coming out that you know now? I guess would be like buckle up, Buttercup. It's gonna be like a <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, I really thought it would be a lot easier than it was. I was excited, like many people, to come home and to be able to reconnect with my family, my loved ones, and just have freedom. And yet. I had no idea of how many doors would be closed in my face, and I, I was very, you know, I had a really good work ethic, I, I'm kind of personable, I, I, I work hard, I, I was in college classes for years, like I said, it took me six years to go home. If I think someone told me, like, you're, you're going to have to not only just prove yourself, you're going to have to create a, a network, you're going to have to, I think, for uh, formerly incarcerated people, it's fairly important to develop entrepreneurial. Uh, endeavors because a lot of people that are a part of corporations are just going to tell you no because of felony blanket ban. So, like, be able to uh, start your own business, I think, is extremely um, you know helpful to know that. Uh, other things would be like just the, the social acclimatization process, like coming home, it, it reconnecting with family for me, even those that I know love me. It was hard for me to, to as a man, express my feelings and, and to be able to cry. And, and, and embrace people that I haven't seen for almost a decade. That was extremely hard. I had no clue that the trauma from being inside was so impactful. And honestly, even to this day, like, I still have nightmares about prison. I have nightmares about the police in my neighborhoods coming to get me. I don't get parole. And I talk, I do research and I've talked to hundreds of other people who've been inside. And it's not everybody, but it's a very common feat. Trauma is something that deeply lives in your body and never goes away. You can work on it, you can certainly heal trauma to an extent, but it's something that stays with you. Uh, I've gotten better over the years, but like I guess I never have got away from it. So, so uh, in terms of, so obviously your guys' organizations um, support folks, and, and I'm going to dive into that in, in just a second here. Um, in terms of other other resources that I've heard about, that we're going to be highlighting here. Um, certainly, uh, we have nothing if not a supportive and engaged community. Um, so there's lots of private organizations, like these wonderful organizations we're highlighting here, um, that we can get uh, into more detail about those types of resources, um, as well as an incredible network of, of churches that are doing, you know, churches and places of worship that are doing incredible, incredible work in this regard. Um, in the community. Uh, the city of Detroit uh, hosts through Project Clean Slate um, regular expungement fairs. Um, there's some other related events that, that we're going to be highlighting as well. Um, but I'd love to, since I have two experts sitting on stage here, uh, I'd love to specifically ask you about um, your guys' program. So uh, given your experience working with, with this population, what strategies or resources have you found um, to be particularly effective in helping folks thrive? So we have found that collaboration is key for us um, because we think we're taking what uh, we consider an innovative approach to create jobs for the ladies when they come home. Um, there's some resources that we currently in-house cannot provide, so we work with or other organizations who provide um, other resources that, that we currently don't um, provide. We um, work with um, just various organizations. I'm sorry, I got a little choked up here because of um, some other things that are going on. But we strive to um, provide the resources that the ladies need. We have a, a life coach that comes into our facility who works with the ladies on a weekly basis. We provide them with a health and wellness coach. Those are some things that we provide. But we also work with outside organizations as well. So, um, as I mentioned, we provide daily bread. That's a big deal. Um, pay is a stabilizing factor. Mm -hmm. um, we provide consistency. So, individuals engage with us five days a week. Four days, they go out on the crew, they receive daily pay, daily transportation, daily feedback, and that fifth day, they come into the office where we create a family environment to support them and help them overcome their barriers. Um, those are some of the really key 
parts of, of what we do. The consistency, the, the daily accountability, um, and also it's the show that you collaboration. Um, I've got a gentleman here who, uh, from the Community Social Services of Wayne County who's a great supporter of our program. Um, they provided um, interview attire for every person who graduated. Um, you got a shirt and tie and pants or a women's business suit. Um, and then we, we partner with the Detroit Justice Center. Because so many individuals come home owing thousands and thousands of dollars in child support that they didn't know that one form can waive the entire state's portion of that. So um, collaboration is, is really helpful for us. We are definitely looking for um, a partner to help us with some of the mental health um, challenges that we're having. Um, and we're working on building out those sort of partnerships. But uh, the consistency and daily uh, reinforcement along with collaboration that's the strategies that have been used for us. Wonderful, thank you. And, and uh, notably, I mean, both of your programs focus on transitional employment. So could you speak quickly to just like, how important is just like somebody having a chance at that first job to sign that failure to work a lot? So when an individual comes home, um, some folks may have never had a job before, ever, other than in prison. Or if they did, they have had a job. It was uh, a very long time ago. So transitional employment, meaning I, I hire an individual regardless of how they are presenting. Mm -hmm. And I give them a, an entry level work opportunity and provide them with supports and feedback and um, help build them up until they're what we call job start ready. It's so important because you set somebody up for failure because you know this person just got out of prison. Um, and I can give you a seminar on dressing for success and give you a suit, but the daily repetition of I just showing up for work all the time, following a set of instructions, learning how to cooperate with your supervisor and your peers, and being on time, all those things, getting in the routine of that is so important before we hand this person off to a permanent job. Um, it, it's, it's very important preparation, and uh, it sets both the employer up for more success and our participants. So a lot of the women in our program have been away 30 and 40 years, and this is their very first job. Um, we provide, like I said, it's, it's pretty non-traditional. We manufacture handbags that are created using repurposed wood. And the reason we selected that material is we wanted to demonstrate how something deemed as having no value, how it can be transformed into something new and something beautiful and how that same transformation can take place in the lady's life. So they have full reign as far as selecting the colors. Uh, they, when they create the handbags, they're actually assembling. So let's, they're, they're doing some assembly work, which can be, uh, they can do some other assembly work outside of what we're doing. But when they're assembling the handbags, it, it represents them rebuilding their life one piece at a time. So a lot of the things that we try and do, it, it, it has a lot of meaning them and so that they're not just doing something just to be doing it when they're selecting the colors some of the ladies have told me you know express that they selected the black because they were in a dark place at that particular time and the yellow was like a ray of sunshine and uh, so it, it, it's a little bit different um, than the traditional work but we're we are providing them with the job because they do have to show up one time they do get a salary to be as creative as they'd like to be and um, we just encourage them to be as creative. We get the ladies out and engaged in the community. When we create our products, the ladies, um, we, they, we go to various art shows and various venues, and they're standing there talking about their project, and, and they just feel like a sense of responsibility and accomplishment that they make when they're, when they're out and engaged in the community. So uh, just in the interest of time, I just kind of, uh, Pivot into kind of the next piece of the conversation here, which is uh, transformation. So, like, what what does it look like to uh, to successfully uh, transform oneself uh, coming out of prison? Um, so, to start, Aaron, uh, I'd love. Uh, so first of all, I just want to thank you so much for always being so candid and, and honest and transparent about your situation. Um, and in that uh, in that spirit, I was hoping you could dive into a bit more detail. Um, Aaron's crime was notably a, a violent crime, uh, and I think there's a tendency in our society, um, even amongst criminal justice advocates, to focus the um, majority of the effort on uh, nonviolent offenders. Um, 
and I think there's kind of a class of, of, uh, of crime that's kind of viewed uh, to a degree um, as being potentially irredeemable uh, or kind of being attached to a certain extra type of stigma. Um, so I, I would make a strong case for Aaron being, uh, Aaron's story being one that, that <coughs> throws that out the window. Um, and I was hoping that you could kind of speak to kind of what, what allowed you to, to shift your mindset from that of uh, someone who had the uh, ability to, to commit such a violent crime to being someone who's, who's now such a productive member of society? Yeah, great, great question. And, and certainly there is, um, so a big part of the national movement, just briefly, is that you know we do look at um, you know violent crime as not necessarily redeemable. We look at you know, and certainly we do need to focus on nonviolent um, charges, particularly with the war on drugs. But that's a whole other tangent that will take me two hours to discuss. So we should certainly look at that. But um, the reality is, in the Michigan Department of Corrections, over half the people are there for violent offenses. So that's the reality. And then roughly 95% of them are going to come home, and that's national too. Like. We've got to think about ways to engage these populations. So I think my story of success is kind of like two part. Um, as a young, I, I guess I consider myself a child. At 18, I'm sorry, anybody in the audience that's 18, you're a baby. Like, no offense, but like, you, there's all kinds of research about cognitive development where if you're, if you understand psychological literature, you don't really fully cognitively develop to your mid 20s. Uh, and particularly for young men, we're just kind of all wackos at that age. Even all of you that are very successful in this, I'm sure we all have some stories that we could tell. Maybe someone should have went in prison in this audience, but didn't when they were 17 or 18. So uh, what changed me was once I got into prison at the age of 18, and the irony of all this is that the people that helped me transition out of that violent mindset, and it took a while, I spent a lot of time in solitary confinement. I was still violent in prison, I was telling Correctional staff and administrators that go to hell on a daily basis. But what changed me was was growing, aging out of crime. And there's a lot of academic literature that talks about that. So the closer I got to my mid 20s, I'm insured. So physically, there were some changes in me. Um, educating myself was a big key as well. Reading literature, and, and it was the lifers and the long timers who most committed violent acts, particularly murder, who, for the first time in my life, I had violent men surrounding me that were not committing violence in front of me, were not being violent towards me, but were mentoring me and being father figures that were like, you know, all this crazy shit we did when we were younger, and what you did in it was completely wrong. And these are men that are in their 30s or 40s that have been down for decades, and they really transformed themselves. So after a while, I think, like, I started to organically get that same mindset, and then with the mentorship of these men who have really transformed their lives, and, and in my, like, like some of these men, I would consider smarter than some of the academics that work with them, honestly. <laughs> that had PhDs or masters or so, whatever. I mean, that's great to have a nice piece of paper that says you're smart. But like, these guys were just really well read, articulate, and community engaged in a prison space. They seen an opportunity in me and in an intellectual capacity and, and the fact that I was going to come home. I think they really um, put me on that pathway. And then when I came home, uh, that was a difficult, you know, transition, but like I realized that I had family that was still actively involved in criminal activity and I decided that there was two pathways. I could either go back into that lifestyle and probably end up killing someone, being killed, or going to prison for the rest of my life like some of these men I left. Or can I try something different like these men taught me to gain an education and learn about my community and start to build up and support my community as opposed to destroy it, and that's the pathway that I eventually chose. It was incremental, it wasn't an overnight epiphany by any means, but I think with structure, and that's been talked about on this panel too, giving people when they first come home that structure, that's one thing I miss from prison. Well, anything I can say for there's a structure in prison that's very consistent. To create a seamless transition home for structure and have people mentor them and people that are supportive um, of formerly incarcerated people is extremely important. And, and in a similar vein, you guys, uh, could, could each of you share maybe a, a transformation story of someone who's come through your program? Yes, um, there's a young lady in our program currently, Ms. Charlene, and that's why I'm getting a little choked up tonight because she's having major surgery tomorrow. But Ms. Charlene served 41 years in prison. She is an amazing woman. She's like 4'11", a little dynamo. 
But when Ms. Charlene joined our organization, she was, I was told not to hire her because she still had this prison mentality. I don't know what a prison mentality is, but that's what I was told. And when she came and interviewed for the program, I just fell in love with her. She is such a sweet person. And I asked her, I said, Ms. Charlene, how did you survive 41 years in prison? And she said, you know what, I never gave up. She said, every single day, I would get up and say, today I'm going home. Didn't happen today, the next day, today I'm going home. She said it took her 41 years, but eventually in 2017, she came home. Ms. Charlene, um, and I don't think she likes her sharing, she was diagnosed with an illness in, in April. Tomorrow she's having surgery. But she and I learned so much together. We went, we went to her treatments together, and then to the point where she is now taking the bus, going, doing it on herself, and she'll call me and say, Michelle, you know what? I did it on my own. I went to my appointments, she'll walk, she's, I mean, she's just an amazing woman. So keep her in your prayers, because it will be there. We're gonna close our office just to be there to support her tomorrow. My success story is about um, success, not necessarily transformation. So there's a gentleman who has uh, come to our program. His name is Danico. Um, Danico went to prison when he was 17, and um, his house was firebombed, and his response to that was to go get the gun that he was in the house and respond. Um, he murdered a person at 17, and he served 27 years for that. So he was a child, he responded the way he knew how to, which he saw as self-defense, and he spent his, his entire adult life in prison. So I don't know that he was a murderer in the sense that we, we think. I think had he been able to afford a different attorney, he might have gotten a different sentence. Um, had he not been in that part of the neighborhood, that might not, not have happened. So um, I see his story as disadvantaged. So Danilo came home after 27 years, and he came to the CEO program. Danico was wonderful, working on our crews, great work ethic, and pretty quickly, within a couple months, we had interviews and job offers. And when it came time to start the job, Danico was afraid to take the bus because he had spent his entire adult life in prison Many of the things that make a teenager or a child nervous, those still, things still apply to this man in his 40s. This man is six foot three, wonderful disposition, and he said, I can't do it. So we made a field trip. We took the bus. We, we took the bus to show him we can all do it. We got on that bus and we figured it out. He didn't end up taking the job, but um, <laughs> Danico also owed $46,000. So we had a partnership with Detroit Justice Center, his business, that was the state's portion of it. Um, since then, Nico has gotten a forklift cert certification, a lead and asbestos abated certification, an OSHA 30 certification. He um, was placed at, in a job where he's, he was making $13 an hour, and he recently got offered a position um, as a forklift driver, making $16 an hour. Um, Danico comes to visit us once a week and brings us hot cookies. Um, but we're just really proud to see him continuing to move up. But he just needed that support. Um, I don't know that it was just this huge transformation. I think part of what's missing in this conversation is some of what's unfair that sends folks away for the amount of time that they've been so away for. So, so something that you just hit on that I think is so important to take away is uh, just how language and the, the way that we're talking about people and these issues is so uh, important. I think it's really easy to, uh, you say criminal, and I think it, it's very easy to, for a lot of folks to dismiss folks, to label that, that sticks with you. Um, is, you know, if you hear us using language like returning citizen, formally incarcerated, um, that's intentional because it, you know the idea is it, it's part of a broader shift of of uh, viewing people as you know someone made a mistake they served time and they are returning to be a, a citizen they're a full citizen and should have all the the rights and respect that that, uh, that comes with that I believe everyone would probably agree with that um, so I'm hoping just to, to dive a little bit deeper there and talk about 
um, like common misconceptions that we may not have touched on already. Um, and one that I want to highlight, um, given that we are launched, you know, this is part of a, a new movement of <coughs> the uh, institutional Jewish community through uh, the Jewish, uh, the JCRC, the Jewish Community Relations Council at AJC. Um, I just want to highlight that this is an issue that directly impacts the Jewish community. There are, there are Jews that also go uh, to prison, and I actually, um, I'll, I'll keep his identity um, you know, confidential, but uh, a, a gentleman reached out to uh, my podcast partner, Eric, and I, um, who was transitioning out of a long prison sentence, middle-aged Jewish man, um, who uh, we kind of like tried to, to help him out in his transition, and some of the challenges that he faced were things that I never even considered. Um, so talking about, uh, he, he's uh, Shomer Shabbos and he keeps kosher. Uh, so access to kosher food was something that he, uh, so yes, the, we, have, we have Yad Ezra uh, in the Jewish community, kosher food pantry. It, what, Yad Ezra was not open during the hours that he was, uh, that he was able to, to leave his hiding, he was on house arrest. Um, so he wasn't able to go to Yad Ezra. Um, he couldn't find a synagogue uh, that would accept him. So this is a person who's, who's uh, religious and wants to be engaged with the synagogue community, which would obviously be helping him uh, in his transformation, and, and, and he was unable to find, I think he did ultimately find a community, um, but struggled to find an accepting uh, synagogue. So um, just in terms of common misconceptions, I just want to make sure that folks uh, recognize that this is something that, 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 for Jewish folks in the audience, this is something that directly impacts our community um, in a way that I think uh, is, is so heavily stigmatized that I think a lot of times people assume this is something that impacts only other communities, um, and that's certainly not the case. Um, other common misconceptions that we might have? I um, am close to well, returning citizens with doctorate degrees, with multiple masters who are very talented and brilliant, um, and when they get out there just as brilliant and just as talented and need opportunities. Um, CEO also is known for serving all participants, so we don't restrict our participation. So we do serve individuals who have um, a stigmatized conviction, like something of criminal sexual conduct. Um, and there's also a misunderstanding of that every individual with a conviction related to criminal sexual conduct, conduct is not necessarily violent. You could be caught having sex on their life and get a criminal sexual conduct conviction that will follow you and brand you. Um, so it's really important for an employer to look at the recency, the relevance, and really do a case by case rather than just, you know, dismiss someone because they have a conviction. Um, so we try and we are inclusive as well. We um, don't look at the lady's background. We, we know where they come from and we understand that um, we, I'm so sorry, I, I keep thinking about Michelle, she called me just before the program, before this, and she's not well, and so I'm, I'm just a little upset you know, about this, and then the question that you asked me earlier kind of got me a little, um, uh, a little friend, so we lost one of our members earlier in, the, in January, and then um, her name came up, and it just kind of got me all. She passed away in January, so I'm a little, you know, a little emotional about that. I'm going to pass on. So, so something to highlight quickly uh, on Michelle's behalf is uh, notably her program is focused on female return citizens. I think oftentimes people uh, you know, associate men with, with uh, this issue. Um, and in reality, women are actually the fastest growing segment of the prison population. Um, so when we think about programs and resources, um, I think it's really important to, to um, decentralized men and really think of this in a broader sense of an issue that impacts people across all, uh, all backgrounds while also recognizing that this is an issue that is directly impacting the black community, uh, the African American community in a way um, that is, is just simply not uh, parallel. Uh, it is, um, so I think, I think those two things can be uh, in tandem. So like a broad misconception, I think, is to move beyond like just specific demographics, racially or ethnically or religious background. Um, I think a lot of people that come from more privileged backgrounds, just in general, think that, you know, just because they're in, you know, offense and it lives in West Bloomfield, but like, that you're disconnected from crime, that somehow crime does not impact you. 
because of the community that you live in. But what I want you to understand is that there's so many degrees of separation and the fact that you know other communities are experiencing incarceration, and let's be real, if it is predominantly people of color, people that are from um, impoverished communities, Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanic, now Arab Americans, um, immigration and control that is a new arm of the carceral state where we're just locking up anybody that has a brownish tinge to their skin. You're going to jail, you're going to jail, you're going to, you know, that's just where we're going. So I want you to understand is that this is all of our problem. Regardless of where you're from and your background, if you've never met a person from prison, or it, it, this affects all of us. All of your tax dollars um, are going towards the expansion of the carceral state. On average, we spend thirty to $50,000 per prisoner in the Michigan Department of Corrections. Depending on the level that they um, are going to, it's a lot higher. We have a lot of... Um, People that are terminally ill, men and women in the, in the system that are, you know, going through cancer treatment or they're 60, 70 years old, they're no longer a threat to society, and yet we want to spend $90,000, $100,000 a year on them instead of bringing them home and putting them in hospice where we can get them Medicaid or some other services. So I just really want everybody to challenge all of you to like consider that this impacts you regardless of where you live. And, and it's not right to, if you do come from privilege, to not be able to consider ways that you and that's a religious tenet that goes across every major religion. Like, you should help those that are not as fortunate as you. So I really empower and challenge all of you. If you have resources, access to government officials, money, just volunteering your time is extremely powerful, too. I just encourage you to, like, help those that are less fortunate than you and help us build a community that we're all um, able to work together and, and flourish in our lives. So I think we've successfully uh, convinced anyone who might not have already been convinced uh, that, that this is a, a deeply broken system with major room for improvement. Um, so what I'd love to do is, is transition uh, into, uh, onto a lighter note. Uh, so I was hoping that, that each of you could touch on something related to this topic that you're particularly excited about right now. Um, and specifically, um, Aaron or whoever else, um, perhaps on like, recent policy wins or um, organizations that you've heard of that are doing particularly exciting work. Um, oh, oh, uh, one thing that I know of that's going on right now, you mentioned this Clean Slate initiative. Currently, to get people that have criminal histories taken off the books, it's for one nonviolent felony or two misdemeanors. There is nobody in the state that has one nonviolent felony or just two misdemeanors. Let's be real. There are some people I'm exaggerating a little bit, but like got to understand this, and myself included, like, I picked up eight felonies in the course of a five-minute confrontation with police. And I'm not trying to minimize that by any means, but you got to understand that one choice I made within a split second gave, racked up eight felonies. Um, and people pick up all these different charges, but again, I've, I've demonstrated that I've redeemed myself. Margaret just mentioned she knows plenty of people that have advanced degrees, they're successful. When do the felonies stop? They don't. Surprise. Um, Clean Slate is now getting expanded. Safe and Just Michigan um, is a nonprofit out of Lansing. They're working with the American Civil Liberties Union and other organizations to where we're trying to bring before state senators and state representatives during this fall semester where hopefully we can change and have an automatic expungement process. So I encourage all of you to go to Lansing if you hear about any of these things. There's some caveats to that where we're trying to carve out certain things where Politicians may not be willing to forgive people that have CSC charges or, um, you know, murder one. But I think we can tackle a big chunk of people that are coming home and just trying to do well in their community. So I encourage you to look into that Clean Slate initiative and to where people come home, they don't have to spend thousands of dollars on an attorney to try to get their record clean and have a fresh start. I would say housing. I, I, we're very fortunate that all of the women in our program have housing. They, uh, we work with organizations, um, Detroit Recovery Project, who have been very instrumental in, in helping our ladies get housing. And the Detroit City Council has been very instrumental as well in, in creating these new laws um, or, um, that allowing so that landlords will not discriminate against formerly incarcerated individuals when they go in to apply for housing. So for us, I think that, that's huge. I would say um, more employers are willing to adjust their hiring practices. Um, so, so much of my job is just saying, let's talk about this. <laughs> um, 
the unemployment rate in Michigan and Detroit is in single digits right now. So employers are more willing to have a conversation about opening up policies to employ individuals that customarily have been discriminated against. Um, I just saw Oakland County is now banning the box. And the city of Detroit got bans the box. Um, Henry Ford Health Systems, which is a huge um, partner for us, bans the box. Oh, oh, sure. So, um, typically when you fill out an employment application, the application asks if you've been convicted of a felony. Um, and that puts a person, puts a hiring person in a position to just immediately dismiss the application. So, companies that ban the box take that question off of the application. It doesn't necessarily mean the question will never come, but there's consideration for the individual, their fitness for the position before that question is answered. Um, notably, DTE doesn't ask the question until uh, a job offer is extended. And then even after it's asked, if a person has an offense for drunk driving, no, they can't be hired as a driver. But they'll consider them for customer service, for an engineering role, for a director level role. So there aren't restrictions um, other than relevance of the offense. So um, I'm encouraged by some of the conversations that I'm having with employers who are willing to um, adjust their hiring practices for their own business need, but also just understanding that it's, it's just not as black and white as it may seem when someone has a felony. And just very quickly, just in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to give a shameless plug to our podcast, The Returning Citizen. Um, my, my partner Eric uh, is here with us. Um, so basically, Eric brought up this idea. Uh, Eric spent 18 years in prison uh, out of a mandatory life sentence um, for a nonviolent drug crime. So uh, first of all, the legal climate in Michigan has changed such that that's no longer a thing that happens. Um, but stuff like that is happening in our country uh, all over the place. It's, Talking about that. Uh, but Eric approached me with this idea of, of what if we launched a podcast uh, that was focused on sharing success stories that, that could inspire people. Um, so without going into, into too much detail, um, I encourage folks to check it out, theReturningCitizen.org, um, where we are basically inundated with, uh, we, we can't keep up with the number of, ex of, of positive stories that come across our desk. We can't put out episodes fast enough. So that's what I'm excited about, is that the deeper I dig into this issue, the more people I discover are doing just the most incredible uh, work, whether it's transitional employment programs, whether it's uh, providing education, all these different things. There's, our community has so many exciting initiatives underway. Um, and now we have the Coalition for Black Community uh, addressing this topic head on, which is very exciting. Um, so uh, to, to round out, you guys, uh, I was hoping that you could uh, speak to how folks in the audience can get involved. So if somebody's here, they're inspired, or perhaps they have a loved one um, or a friend who's, who's going uh, through this situation. Uh, how can folks get involved? So CEO provides employment <coughs> services to parolees currently. So if there's an individual who needs some assistance with employment services, I have cards in the back and also flyers. and. We work closely with the Michigan Department of Corrections, so we would need to work with their agent to get them enrolled, but please feel free to reach out. Um, but the two things that really drive our success are partnerships for employment. So if you're in a position where a decision-making position within a company that can use uh, staff, um, we have individuals who have various backgrounds. We have a professional engineer, um, a, dental hygienist, um, we have a welder, so we have a number of different backgrounds. Um, so please contact me for that. And then lastly, um, our organization operates based on our work groups. So right now I have one work group, and every day they go out and they do landscaping and debris removal for the Detroit Land Bank. So I have a contract with the Land Bank. They pay me, I pay my guys, so that's kind of how it works. So I would love to be able to do more of that. Right now I can employ about 75 folks annually with my one work group. So um, I'm looking for additional opportunities for that. If I can provide a work group for an organization to do landscaping or warehousing 
or laundry or typically something that's entry level, those are opportunities that we love to even bid for, um, which would allow us to grow our ability to serve individuals coming home. So, quick regards to that. A uh, quick interjection, uh, after uh, this one's answered the question, we're going to be transitioning into Q&A. So if anyone, if you have any uh, lingering questions that haven't been uh, answered yet, please uh, finish up your questions and put them on so that folks in, uh, in the back can come and collect them for you. We, we have an immediate need. We're currently operating out of a, what we call a creative suite. It's about a 400 square foot space where we have house for women. They come every day to the suite and we're looking to relocate. So if anyone knows of any um, space, 1,200 square feet, we want to put our ideas to bring on additional women um, so that we can provide them with the resources that they need to help them on the journey. But in the space that we're in right now, we can only accommodate four women. We also are looking for um, community partners. When the ladies transition out of our program, we try to identify what their interests are. So we have one lady, one of our uh, participants who transitioned out. She was in the culinary arts. We were able to place her with one of the local uh, vegan restaurants, and she's a chef there. So we also are looking to partner with companies and organizations who are hiring so that when our ladies leave our program, we can help them transition to, into other employment. Well, first, my shameless plug, too. Uh, I've got students in the audience right now that are either undergraduate or graduate students in my criminology and criminal justice program. So any of you that are interested in going back to school or advancing your education, come check out our program at U of M Dearborn. We're uh, a Michigan branded program that's not even that far from the city of Detroit. So come check us out. And, and what can all of you do um, other than come to my program? Uh, I think a lot of people don't take advantage of coffee hours for government officials, so for your senators, your reps, your congressperson, go have conversations with them. And, and we often think, like, at least this is what I always talk about, is that, you know, uh, there's this idea that only um, wealthy individuals, lobbyists, corporations get that access to um, government, which certainly does happen a lot. But you as individual citizens that are voting in whatever district you are, you have the, um, the potential to like change policy. Uh, nobody gets voting blocks together. Nobody really goes into a coffee hour or a senator or rep's office and say, hey, you know, I have this idea about clean slate. You know, what is this that I'm hearing about? Are you uh, in support of this? Do you oppose this? Are you somewhere in between? really have your concerns, and not just criminal justice reform, but just anything that is something that's deeply uh, a problem in your community, you need to take these problems to um, government officials that have the capacity to make change. And as a constituent of that district, guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna probably do what you ask them to do if you bother them enough. Mm -hmm. Because they know that you and the more people you bring in there on that voting block, it's gonna keep them in office. So, and, and then, I, on top of that, consider running for office. I think there's a lot of non-traditional people, particularly younger folks, that think that it's impossible to run a campaign without having, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars from corporations. But if you develop a grassroots organization or a movement and really have a good platform to create effective policy change, then you should do that and really get your um, community together and, and figure out what are the issues that are important for you and the people that live in your community and really force politicians to do the right thing for what the needs are for you and your family and friends in that area. Fantastic, thank you guys. And so transitioning into some questions from the audience. Um, how, so you both touched on uh, encouraging employers uh, to, to get on board hiring folks. Um, what strategies have you found to be effective in maybe convincing businesses to hire businesses? So, uh, data is good. There have been a number of studies done that demonstrate that returning citizens are more likely to stay in their jobs longer. Um, you can present a um, value proposition just on having an employee turnover. Um, additionally, there's a work opportunity tax credit, which is a tax credit when you hire individuals who are returning citizens. The state of Michigan and the federal government offer something called <coughs> bonding which is insurance against employee theft um, that's offered to employers at no cost who hire returning citizens. And I tell the Nico story. And I try to make it folks cry. But um, typically, um, there are real benefits to hiring returning citizens. And then 
CEO provides an added level of support that I haven't mentioned yet. So after our participants are placed, we retain engagement with them for a year. During that year, we, Nina does, Nina checks in with them twice a month. We maybe go visit them at their work site. Um, when they're having challenges in the workplace, they call us and we talk about it. How do you handle this out? Please don't cuss out your boss. Um, but we also provide financial literacy. Let's get a bank account now. Are you interested in upscaling? Okay, let's connect you to that training. Maybe we'll pay for it or find some funding for it. So there's there's a an added level of support that employers appreciate because a person's more likely to stay when they still have support saying. So one of the things we do, we get, we do this is pretty much the same thing. We get out and we engage with the employers. We follow up with the employees, ensure that they are doing their job. If there are any issues, we try and help to resolve some of those things. Um, the, our one of the things that um, we were very successful in is is talking with our employees to find out what their what their interests are. So we don't want to place someone in a position as a secretary and their interest is culinary arts. So we help them to make those decisions as to where their career paths are. We're a fairly new organization. So our first group of women who um, have tra transitioned out, one decided she didn't want to work because her mom is still living and she served 44 years in prison. So she wanted to spend her time with her mom. The other young lady um, got ill, so we weren't able to place her. Some of the women who are part of our focus group are the women who we, we've been able to place and we've been able to track them. And all of them are doing quite well in the positions that they're in. I don't really work in the employment sphere, so. Um, so I just want to point out, so these are all fantastic questions. We're not going to get to all these. Um, especially for the folks that asked really specific personal questions about, about your situation. Um, I'm sure that the folks uh, up here would be happy to chat with you in private, um, but I'm going to stick to questions that, that address kind of the broader, um, the broader response, but uh, that's not to suggest that those questions are any less uh, legitimate. Um, so if this is an interesting question, uh, if you guys could wave a magic wand and change one aspect of the criminal justice system, uh, what would it be? Prison. <laughs> Why do we need it? Um, I think, and this is a new thing of mine. Um, there's a woman, Gilmore, who writes, so she considers, she calls herself a prison abolitionist. And it, it occurred to me that things are so normalized to us that we, we think that's a natural, that natural response. So she advocates that prison is not the normal response to social problems. So in other countries, because if you think about it, he gave this, these statistics earlier, we have far more people in prison here than anywhere else in the world, and we don't have the highest population. It's just how we've chosen to, to respond to social problems. So she talks about creating better conditions that prevent the path to prison. That are, are, we're focused on the response as opposed to, okay, let's have better educational systems, let's have clean water, but all the things that, that lead up to that point. So, um, I don't think prison is a good thing. It needs to go away. We need to address the real issues in our society. To go further in that, I think that a, a big chunk of our prison populations could be um, released without um, really any type of serious impact on our communities. I, I do think we need prisons, but just at a much smaller scale. I think there are some people that really need to be locked up forever. I've met some people like that, uh, and that's very rare, but I think if you look at the era of mass incarceration as we, we know it now, and that started off in the early 70s when we started the war on drugs, we had uh, a population of people incarcerated roughly 250,000 people nationwide. And that was roughly 1970, 1971. Fast forward a couple years ago, we had 2.4 million people. So that's multiplied by 10. So can we dramatically reduce the prison populations and our jails and be safe? Of course we can, we did it 50 years ago. There's really not that much different with the technological advances, but what's happening is that 
we are creating more social problems you know, as, a, as a government uh, entity that, you know, we're, we're, we're codifying new laws, corporations are shipping jobs overseas, there's less and less opportunities for people, there's redlining in the city of Detroit and other places where people are not getting access to affordable housing, the government's poisoning the city of Flint and other places too, so like, when we don't address these things, the response then is, well, there's problems in our community, so let's just lock everybody up. I don't think that's right. There are some people who need to be locked up, I think, for a long time, if not forever, but it's very few. I mean, honestly, out of 100 people, maybe a couple, and that's extremely rare, but a vast majority, of, even someone that committed a violent act like myself, that was learned behavior. I learned that in my, that doesn't excuse my behavior, but I learned that in my community. So if someone gave me an education, had me in a better areas instead of projects and seeing violence, getting health care and opportunity, and my mom had a job, I wouldn't even be sitting up here now talking about this whole trajectory that I've gone through. So I think we've got to think of things in a little different lens. I think obviously we, we talked about mental health being such a, you know, sure. off, oftentimes with drug crimes, drug, crime, drug addiction, um, treating drug addiction as, as a mental, you know, as a, as a health issue as opposed yeah. to a, a criminal issue. Um, and then, I was just going to add that people commit crimes, but I don't think that we get to decide that someone like someone's life doesn't have value anymore. I don't. Um, and other other nations handle it a different way. Um, mental health is, is a big issue, but I just don't believe that folks are bad. <laughs> I think that people are hurt and damaged and need help and support and restoration and reconciliation. Um, a few people asked about recidivism. So, Aaron, I think you could probably speak to the, the numbers here. So, what what do current recidivism rates look like? I guess they're, they're horrible. horrible. <laughs> um, uh, basically, and, so and what, what what does data say is the most effective way to reduce? Um, so, the, the, the most effective way to tackle recidivism is access to post secondary education while people. That has the, the highest drop, which is approximately 43%, and that's not getting a degree in prison, that's just having one college class. That's any access to the higher education on the inside dramatically reduces recidivism by 43%. Um, the recidivism rates, I don't know Michigan specifically, and Michigan fudges their numbers a little bit, so I'm not gonna go there, but nationally, um, according to the Department of Justice, if you go out, so someone's been home nine years, after their ninth year, the likelihood of them returning to prison or just being rearrested, recontacted with the system is 83%. Wow. So I've been home 12 years now, and that's a longitudinal study, and they haven't gotten the data up to that point yet, but I'm pretty safe to say that if they marked it up to the 12 years that I've been home now, it's gonna be in the 90s. So that, and that's not that everybody in the system is a scary psychopath. That's not the case. It's the, the matter of, again, there's very intentful, specific policies that are not allowing people to get paroled, that are not allowing people to have shorter sentences. We have in Michigan, we have indeterminate sentences, which basically means they might have a 10 to 100 years. Indeterminate means they, they should be eligible for parole after 10 years, but they might stay there until they're like 70 or 80 years old. And they'll either pass away or they get paroled out when they're in their 80s. But we've decided that they're safe for 10 years, and yet we hold them much longer. And that's a burden on taxpayers. It's not helping public safety. Thank you so much, Bert. Thank you so much, guys. So just uh, before we wrap up here, again, I encourage everyone to stick around and, and, and chat and continue asking uh, all these great questions. Uh, I just want to highlight, um, to give folks a sense of some of the programs that are available coming up. Um, we just kind of touched base on this uh, right before to, in terms of uh, putting our, our heads together. Um, so this upcoming Monday, the 9th, uh, there's an exciting expungement announcement happening in the city of Detroit. Um, so we're actually going to follow up uh, with everybody um, via email or however else would be best to follow up with you about locations and time and everything. Um, but an exciting expungement announcement um, in the city of Detroit. There is a uh, re-entry Tuesday happening on the 24th of this month um, from the morning to the early afternoon um, that is going to focus on um, ID issuing and, and other issues that we, that we discussed here. Uh, and Mike, Mike Larry Dyson will be there. Uh, celebrity uh, who 
who's super knowledgeable about this topic uh, will be in attendance. Um, and then, uh, oh, I wanted to mention that Project Cleanslate uh, that we've brought up a number of times. Uh, there's an expungement fair on the 28th of September, um, as well as, if I'm not mistaken, I think they actually do like regular, uh, I think it, it, there's like additional kind of like mini fairs in between um, that they do, but there's a, a big expungement fair on the 28th at uh, Straight Gate International Church, and again, we'll follow all this uh, information. Uh, so one quick thing to you. Um, so beyond policy and government and making all these big effective changes, I just hope that all of you will, will take this conversation out of the shadows and stop being silent, because silence is complicity. Um, talk about this to your family, your friends, and, and, and gather strength in numbers and really make this, instead of a stigmatized issue, and if you have friends or family that have been incarcerated, help them to open up and talk about these issues that impact our community, because there's problems with the justice system. We still have racism in this country. We still have people that are marginalized because of their, their socioeconomic status. These are things we need to talk about and stop being silent about in this, in this state and in the country. Any other final thoughts, guys? Great, so I just want to highlight the fact that this is intended to be a, a launching off point. So this is the hopefully the first of many uh, conversations. Obviously, this one, this conversation is intended to be educational, uh, but we want to hear from you in terms of what other types of programming might be uh, particularly helpful or impactful. Uh, you know, stick around and share that information. Um, Mark Jacobs is going to give a little uh, closing remarks here. Um, uh, thank you very, very briefly. Um, so I'm Mark Jacobs with the JCIC and JC, as well as the Coalition for Black and Jewish Unity. Um, and we have a whole organization. I want to thank Jacob for a wonderful job and the panel. It's a super important Thank you very much.